Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the archetype of the trickster. <laughs> and uh, this has a special place in my small, withered, dark heart, <laughs> because my undergraduate degree was the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting, and there's something about the mercurial quality of changing your character and pretending you're somebody else, and even the great theatrical traditions of tricking and drama and creating false crises and all of that, that just so beautifully brings forward all the play and theater of the trickster. And so we're going to explore that in nature, in psychology, a, a bit in politics and culture, because once you see it, really, you see it everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. And, you know, uh, picking up on what you said, Joseph, I mean, creative deception is indeed a prerequisite of art, isn't it? I mean, the nature of trickery is everywhere in all kinds of art, isn't it? And it's in story. Every story is a little bit of a trick. It's a creative concoction of cause and effect and conflict and resolution that someone has made up. And it evokes delight. Like exactly. when you're reading a story and then suddenly something happens and it ends in a way you couldn't have predicted, there's this like tickle that just comes up in us. Yes, we love being tricked, especially in things like murder mysteries of the who done it you know all the agatha christie ones uh, murder on the orient express and so on who did it who did it we've been fooled and we delight in that or or we love being in on the trick mm -hmm. so like one of the things that's so charming i don't know if you watch the ellen show but sometimes she'll take a major star put a little secret speaker in their ear and then she'll send them out to do something like pick up dry cleaning and then ellen will sit in the studio and tell them what to say and the actual actor will just repeat whatever Ellen says and get into these like outrageous, hilarious kind of interactions with people. And as an audience member, you just kind of squeal <laughs> with the whole kind of harmless but hilarious trick mm -hmm. that's being played. And I think it's it's inherent in human nature. You know, I'm thinking of the stage little ones go through. They're really tiny and they love playing peekaboo. Mm of that there I am, and now I'm not there, and now I appear, and it's a, a very early example of the trickster. And of course, we love to play tricks on each other with April Fools. That's, that's always been a big hit around my house. And I was relentless as a child. I mean, I was the <laughs> only boy in the house. My sisters can like tell these horrific stories of these unbelievably elaborate multi-staged tricks <laughs> so I would like that I would play upon them, and then I would just like I would laugh until I was crying. It was just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's something really delightful and delicious about this, isn't it? On the other hand, there there is a darker polarity, right? Right. Yeah. Of people who get duped out of their retirements, yeah, uh, uh, funding, and people con men. You know, all kinds of, of really dirty and ugly kinds of, of tricks. It's two-sided. Yes, as, as everything is. Uh, but, but as a mythologem, yes. this is a little piece of psyche that plays a very particular function. And, you know, Jung did, did equate it with the shadow. It is related to the shadow. We could maybe think about it as a particular kind of shadow. It tends to be pretty primitive. It tends to be in opposition to our well-manicured persona and our kind of sophisticated ego consciousness. 
It shows up in myths, as we've mentioned, in uh, folk cultures. It might show up as um, the Mummer's Parade or uh, Mardi Gras when when uh, things are kind of turned on their heads, things are turned on their heads and what what is proper is uh, suddenly cast down and what is profane is rules of the day. And we see it in our own lives too when the trickster manifests when we forget our ticket that we were going to need to get into the performance or we uh, forget where we parked our car or any number of other things happen to us that get in our way in the sort of tricksterish fashion. So it's a kind of when the unconscious kind of comes up and uh, abducts memory or common sense or uh, the regular order of things and lets us kind of fall on our butts and go splat. Usually no terrible real harm is done. It, we're reminded uh, that our egos and our rational, cognitive, planning, organized adult minds are not really in charge all the time. There's a way in which trickster constellates or becomes more active when there's an excessive amount of suppression or an excessive amount of control in a system, particularly if the control is stifling life. And so what you'll see in cultures, for instance, if we think back to the old Soviet Union, which is incredibly structured, incredibly rigid, and one could arguably say stifled a tremendous amount of innovation or creativity, and that gave rise to spontaneously rather an enormous trickstery black market economy, you know, as a way to compensate for the incredible stifling rigidity of that economic system. And we even see it now with the rise of the anonymous movement, that there's a way in which the government can become too insular, too rigid, and then these tricky hackers wind up organizing to try to bend the rules. So we could say that the trickster compensates too much rigidity. And that, that might happen on a cultural level, and it could also happen on a personal level. If our ego stance becomes too rigidified, we might find that that's when we slip on the banana peel. You know, I'm thinking we could say that trickster is how the unconscious asserts itself, or it's one of the ways. It's one of the styles in which it can assert itself. Mm -hmm. And often it's, it's a very elegant, if not gauche, kind of compensation for what's going on in the in the ego state. So just to give a couple of examples of unconscious trickster, because, you know, the well-crafted art of trickster, which is we're talking about these theatrical, the mummers and the fools and Shakespeare's plays, but trickster is also can be dangerous. So for instance, I found myself thinking about various evangelical ministers who were kind of icons of purity and structure and in a sense a very kind of rigid moral code. So we have Jimmy Swaggart, who was the first very big televangelist, you know, all about purity and structure and rigidity and really bringing all the followers into this purity pledge system. And then 1988, he's caught cheating on his wife with a prostitute in New Orleans. And then as the investigation blows up, he is an avid consumer of porn and BDSM and all of this other stuff. And so we can imagine that the trickster archetype begins to thrum in the background of a fellow like this, both compelling him into these opposite behaviors to what he's consciously doing and also tricking him into revealing that about himself not covering his tracks, perhaps leaving the credit card stuff out, which has all these nefarious charges on it, because something in the unconscious wants him to trip, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wants him to get laid low. So what you're saying, Joseph, using the example of Jimmy Swaggart, brings up for me the idea of appetite or instinct and uh, what we crave, what we hunger for. 
and that when something is overly rigid or or static something in the psyche that trickster function will insist on doing the very thing uh, that that consciousness prohibits which is really hilarious because people take Ambien and then they're walking around like <laughs> cooking meals and baking cakes and like eating a gallon of ice cream. It's, seriously, because yeah, no, I know. I know. finally taken down and all of a sudden that inner trickster is like, let me out of here. I am <laughs> like all bets are off. <laughs> Yes. Um, you know, Deb, that's interesting that you brought up appetites because uh, one one way of thinking about the trickster that I think shows us just how very deeply archetypal this is, is that some of the earliest tricks that humans used or, or that animals used do have to do with catching dinner. You know, the spider web is a, a great trick. And in fact, the the Homeric Greek word for trick uh, is the earliest use of it uh, has to it means baiting a hook to catch a fish. So there's a lot of trickster stuff that goes on with hunting among animals, but but also among people. And it's fascinating, like those little stonefish that have that little bit of flesh that dangles right in front of their face as if it looks like a worm and bam mm-hmm. and and in the animal world it's really we would call it sociopathic but it is in service to life because that kind of trickster is really devoid of empathy and there is something about trickster that is the antithesis of sincerity mm-hmm. tricksters <laughs> are not sincere right and that's refreshing in a way it is for me frequently <laughs> <laughs> it is a big part of, of animal nature. I read that whales, when they come across a school of herring, uh, swim around the school uh, emitting air, and the air bubbles up and confuses. Fuses, 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 so everybody, fuses, fuses, this fuses, is the trickster <laughs> fighting <laughs> Deb's Heine because she's been fighting about learning about this technology. So we're going to sign off for a minute and reboot. <laughs> Okay, and we're back again. Right. We had to jump back into the recording, but but this whole phenomena of the trickster in the machine and and how we really do feel tricked because we have this incredible structural confidence in the internet and our laptops and technology. Well, <laughs> well you don't and you shouldn't. But, there, but you know, it's like the like voting machines. Yeah. You know, there's all the, oh, it's all going to be online and it's all, we don't need paper ballots anymore and talk about a trick. Yeah. Right. Talk about this Russian interference in the election. I mean, there is this incredible trickster force that's zooming yeah the, the way that technology has really opened us up to that i mean i think of just little things like sending that errant text you know oh, yes. that you're supposed to be you think you're texting your spouse but you're really texting your first client of the day has that ever happened to you <laughs> or butt dialing you know who knew just slipping it in the warmth of my honey and like pressing on this you know the call button yeah. you know Right. I get I get butt dial calls and, and of course <laughs> I listen because I like trickster energy. I'm like pinned <laughs> to this like five minute voicemail because I'm like, who is this? I want to hear what's going on. You know, which is like I'm I'm all of a sudden nine years old spying on my sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a there's a real opportunity for trickster energy to come through with technology and to unseat our false confidence. There's this kind of hubris that comes with technology and so it's the perfect place for us to get caught by the trickster. Yeah. Oh, that could never happen with the voting <laughs> machines ever. Boom. And all of a sudden we're all we're all actually being really shaken up. Mm-hmm. Not get a, a false sense of security and, and a sense of kind of false hubris. And then we wind up tripping into something really painful. Mm-hmm. And you had a wonderful story about hubris as part of uh, trickster mythology. So one of the places that trickster archetype was really, really present in terms of uh, social anthropology was in Native American folk tales. They had very marvelously explicit trickster figures. 
So um, this is a often a, a cited tale from the uh, Hochuk trickster cycle. And so in this uh, kind of very bawdy tale, you know, trickster is walking along aimlessly, you know, through the forest. He's kind of staring at the clouds. And then all of a sudden he hears this little sound and it's kind of like a voice. And he listens really carefully and he hears it sing, if you eat me, you will shit. You will shit. And Trickster wondered, well, why is this person saying such things? So Trickster went in the direction of the sound until he heard quite distinctly someone saying, if you eat me, you will shit. You will shit. Trickster says, oh, I wonder who's saying those things. Oh, I, I, and I know that I'm not going to defecate because I'm the master of my body. And so he comes across and there's this little like flower bulb sitting, you know, in the side of the forest and just kind of taunting Trickster. And there's this wonderful dialogue about, you know, the, the bulb's just a big mouth and a braggart and the Trickster is like, nobody can make me poop. And it goes on and on and on. And finally, the Trickster just pops it in his mouth to just prove his excellence and then there's this hilarity ensues where the trickster is kind of breaking wind and shooting himself across the forest. And then finally he starts <laughs> pooping and he poops so much that he's like threatening the survival of the forest and he's covered in feces and his life is being threatened. And he kind of runs and runs and finally finds help. And sometimes it's Raven who helps him. And sometimes it's the basswood tree that finally tells him, listen, you've got to jump in the lake and wash yourself off. But there's this kind of lesson in these ancient tales about the incredible danger and hilarity of the ego that is cut off from instinct and cut off from the wisdom of the forest, the wisdom of the land. This is a funny tale, but aren't we all in the middle of this with all the climate crises? Are we all trickster walking around saying, oh, don't worry about it. We can... We can harvest all those fossil fuels and we can dump all that plastic in the ocean and the ocean can't make me sick and these things can't affect me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, that we've tricked ourselves as a culture. Mm -hmm. Here we are, mm -hmm. you know, sitting on a pile of poop mm -hmm. and we're, we're in a life-threatening circumstance. It's really everywhere, this tricky and the tricky stuff. It is everywhere, and it, it does uh, kind of compensate for this sort of hubris or rigidity like we were talking about. And Joseph, you said something before about how it's in service to life, and I think that's what we were getting at a little bit when we were talking about the hunting, the way that a lot of hunters use tricks, because it brings the new thing. It brings the necessary thing sometimes, this trickster energy. I'm thinking about the story of Scheherazade. Mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite tales of the trickster. And if, I, if I've if i got this right, um, there's a, a king who uh, marries a princess and then that night cuts her, cuts her head off. And then the next day marries another princess and cuts her head off and like that. So finally it's Scheherazade's turn to marry him and her father begs her, no, don't do it. She says, don't worry, I got this. So uh, she marries this evil king and as they're spending the night together, she said, well, I just want to tell you a story. And so she tells him such a riveting story. She comes to, you know, a, a climax point. She says, I'll tell you the rest tomorrow. He said, <laughs> oh, you know. So he doesn't kill her because he wants to hear the rest of her story. And that goes on for nine months, at which point she delivers his child. And after that, uh, you know, they're, they're all good. So she uses this trickster energy to really turn this very dangerous situation on its head. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a way that when we're in an individuation process, we often have to access trickster energy. I find myself sometimes invoking this when I'm working with someone. You know, we often come into adulthood with certain complexes 
And these complexes mean that we're often acting according to a kind of unconscious script or even compulsion, where we're not really choosing how we react to certain situations. We're just sort of acting fairly unconsciously. So for example, maybe someone who often r- runs a foul, falls a foul of say, um, authority figures in the workplace. And you, you kind of always make the same mistake and no matter what you do, and it's always threatening and a little scary. But as consciousness is brought to it, what begins to happen is the paradigm can get shifted a little bit. And sometimes that first shift of the paradigm requires thinking like the trickster so that we can get ourselves out of that stuck place and come into a situation where there's more choice involved. And uh, and in the beginning, it often feels like we have to play act. We have to be the trickster. And there's a saying about that, uh, fake it till you make it. Exactly. Of try the opposite thing. And so the trickster can kind of jolt us out of a complex, out of a habit, um, out of our rational set of rules and regs about what we should and shouldn't do and surprise us. Uh, And it's not that the trickster is immoral, but the trickster is amoral. Yes. Right. Because these structures of morality are structures of the ego their cultural ego agreements, and they may serve life for a period of time for us, for a period of time in the culture. And then when they become stifling in one way or another, something begins to build up and wants to depotentiate things. And this can be a a big explosion or it can be something just really small. I'm thinking about a a friend of mine who was uh, telling me a story recently And it made me think about this idea of parapraxis, which everybody knows is just Freudian slips, where the unconscious just breaks through the uh, accepted regimen. So a friend of mine is, you know, in the middle of a really high powered meeting, and he's talking about this kind of structure that's going on in the organization, and he's really getting heated. And he talks about how, you know, all of these things are, are really not functioning correctly in these various teams are functioning, and he meant to say erratically, but he said <laughs> all these teams are functioning erotically. It's all over the place. And then all of a sudden, like at the meeting, everybody saw that coming. This. Nobody <laughs> saw that coming. You know, everybody just falls out, and all of this kind of self-righteous uh, indignation, it just falls to pieces. Yeah, that's a perfect trickster story. Yeah. yeah. It makes room for this kind of just deflation of self-righteousness. Mm-hmm. And then they could kind of laugh and roll up their sleeves and say, okay, what's really going on here and what do we need to do? So yeah. I, have a, I have a quote here from Jung that I'll drop in here because I think it's right, relevant to the story you just told. Jung says, the so-called civilized man has forgotten the trickster. He remembers him only figuratively and metaphorically when, irritated by his own ineptitude, he speaks of fate playing tricks on him or of things being bewitched. He never suspects that his own hidden and apparently harmless shadow has qualities whose dangerousness exceeds his wildest dreams. So uh, I'm thinking about how the trickster can also be a mental capacity um, known as lying. Uh. Uh, There's a wonderful story in a book that I'll put in the show notes of Trickster Makes This World, where the author confesses to having snitched uh, some some money and hidden it in a little uh, nook in a tree. And of course, a the, the money was noticed that it was missing, and uh, he had a brother, and so the the suspicion fell on him and his brother, and uh, finally uh, he kind of confessed to you know th- that he'd done it and took his mother out to the tree where he had squirreled away this bank note, but then he lied, and he said there had been another child around. And a, a kid who had come over and this boy, blah, 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 and that, that he hadn't really done it, but that he'd seen the boy and the boy had done it. And his mother very wisely didn't call him on it. The banknote was retrieved. 
but he had a mental capacity to come up with this tall tale, you know, someplace, I think in England out, you know, out in the country where this whole thing is completely unlikely. But that's the mental capacity, a rational cognitive capacity. And mythically, when Hermes is born, uh, that's the first thing he does. He steals his older brother's cattle, and then he lies about it. He says, I didn't do it. You know, I'm just a day-old baby. How could I do it? I don't even know what cattle are. So there is also an intentional uh, trickster capacity, as well as the parapraxies and the, the times when we just blurt out the exact opposite of what we intended to say. Yeah, and this goes to kind of a developmental process that I see in young people as they're kind of transitioning out of high school, maybe into college or into their first jobs, is that they can often be raised in cultures that prize naive behaviors. And people wind up kind of stumbling into sophisticated work situations where they blurt out things because they're being honest or forthright, or they uh, are extroverting too much of what they're thinking or feeling in inappropriate circumstances, and it makes them look childish. And then the system kind of punishes them. So we have to have a certain amount of cunning to kind of read the temperature in the room, mm -hmm. to read what's appropriate, and that will allow us to achieve our ends. And I think what allows us to question whether we're being amoral, immoral, or perhaps in service to life is that we do have to kind of know where we want to go. So even as therapists, we sometimes have to be cunning. We may be thinking things and, and part of us says, you know, this is probably correct or even true, but it's naive for me to just blurt this out in the middle of this moment. But I have to decide to reserve this or to shield it, hide it away in the session and consider whether or not maybe even months down the line, this would then be medicinal instead of disruptive. But hopefully it's in service to something that's constructive. Yeah, and we do it socially all the time. We go over to dear old Aunt Murgatroyd's house, and uh, she makes some kind of concoction. And um, so it's a cultural kind of tricksterism to say, oh, you know, that was just lovely. Uh, what a beautiful meal, and I especially enjoyed the whatever it was. And we're being tricky in order to serve a cultural norm and a social norm, a relational norm. As I recall, there are some studies from the field of primatology that show that chimpanzees, for example, have the ability to be mendacious and to hide things and to be tricky, and that those individuals who are better able to trick their peers are more socially successful. So there is a way in which a certain ability to invoke trickster energy is actually important for moving through life. You know, I, I think that this came up, this is, uh, Jung said something like, knowing your own shadow is the best way to deal with other people's shadows. Hmm. And I think that that's relevant here and, and relates to something that one of you said a minute ago, that, that we have to be able to be a little bit tricky to guard against being tricked. It gives us authority in that world. And as my father used to say, who was raised on the Lower East Side of Man Manhattan, you can't trick a trickster. You can't con <laughs> a con man. You can't shit a shitter. You know, it's like, wow. oh, God. Thanks. You know, and I'm like eight taking notes, you know, um, you know, rough truth. He was a rough and tumble salesman. He was raised in abject poverty in the tenements in New York. Uh -huh. And part of the survival instinct, part of what drives people to survive in environments that are tremendously ungenerous and perhaps in the first generation, is a tremendous amount of trickiness. Well, you, you know, it's funny because he said you can't trick a trickster. But in fact, in many of the myths about trickster, the trickster gets tricked, doesn't he? 
he does, as we talked about with the Native American, but I think a, a con man can see the con, or at least he thinks yeah, he can. Yeah, yes. But right. there's always probably someone who's a little more slick, a little more mm-hmm. developed. The trickster energy forces us to deal with and accept and engage with the world as it is. Mm -hmm. This is what is of in your story, Joseph, about uh, eating that little bulb and then sort of covering the forest with all kinds of excrement and just plain shit. He has to accept his own limitations. This is what is. If you eat me, this is what will happen. Uh, regardless of your will, which makes me think about trickster energy in a more sort of sacred context. And Jung's famous quote that I'm not going to get quite right about, you know, that he calls God, whatever it is for good or ill, that crosses his path and confronts him with something unexpected. Mm. And so there is a sacred uh, element to this, as well as mental, social, cultural, etc., th- that we need to, I think, become conscious of, become aware of. Yeah, Jung, Jung says of the trickster, he says he is a forerunner of the Savior, and like him, God, man, and animal at once. Wow. He is both subhuman and superhuman, a bestial and divine being whose chief and most alarming characteristic is his unconsciousness. So, Deb, I appreciate that you're bringing up this sacred, even divine quality of the trickster. You know, the trickster is that which transforms, right? That which subverts the paradigm, creates an enantiodromia, which means things turn into their opposite, and thereby brings renewal. I think in the in the ideal <laughs> in the ideal situation, you know, Loki was the Norse god who who tricked and who tricked just for the delight of it. Loki mm-hmm. was murderous. Loki was incredibly mercurial in that incredibly dangerous way. Mm-hmm. But I think when Jung is uh, trying to lift us up to that higher arc, we're looking for the life saving or the life preserving or the life enhancing thread that might be under it. But I think um, perhaps in the ancient myths, when tricking was observed so psychopathically in the animal kingdom, where it was tricking so you could eat and kill, you know, there's nothing else to it. And there was absolutely no remorse and no empathy. So I think that the tricking can run on this kind of spectrum and we can hope that it's in service to life, but sometimes it's just plain bone chilling. Yeah, Jung Jung also likens the trickster to poltergeist, you know, Mm. this kind of mischievous, but but pretty nefarious kind of energy. But for good or ill, the trickster is the boundary crosser. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. The upsetter, something that that could be funny, something that could uh, confront us with some of our own shadow, and something uh, that is really nefarious as well. Mm-hmm. And this is the way the world is. And there is something liberating, perhaps, in that. I think about uh, Mel Brooks, who I think is you know a oh. comedian, trickster. You know, when he talks about deciding that he's going to take uh, the Nazi atrocities and turn them into jokes, oh, yes. turn them into chorus line buffoonery. And this effort in the trickster to reach down into the most horrific part of his own family history and cultural history and reclaim it and strip it of its horror uh, and to break it open in a way. And that's trickster in its most kind of shocking, but but in a mm-hmm. sense, but, powerful. And, and transformative. Yeah. That's a movie called Springtime for Hitler. The, it's the producers. It's oh, the I'm producers. sorry. That's yeah. the song. Thank you. You know, it sets people on edge. Joan Rivers was another one who uh, was often really criticized, and she would get really ferocious on talk shows. You know, she'd be like, you know, if something's funny, I'm going to say it. And uh, she was ruthless about what she would kind of joke about in order to depotentiate something perhaps even for her own psyche. Yeah. And and it's true. Comedians are famously yes. uh, known for crossing boundaries, saying the unspeakable. 
and confronting us with our shadow uh, in a way that it, that makes us laugh. So we we can't go into that ego position of just taking offense because that that's just terrible uh, because we're laughing. And laughing is almost a kind of human supernatural capacity to mm-hmm. jump out of the sincerity of a moment and look at it from above and from an unusual angle that creates this liberating incongruity in this circumstance. But but laughter is the opposite of kind of you know things that are drenched in sincerity. And I have to tell you that I have a natural kind of <laughs> irritation, seriously, around sincerity where it starts to feel like sentimentality. I can just feel myself in a lecture that's just slathered with sincerity, wanting to just grab the mic and make a totally outrageous joke in the middle of the room. Which is why which is why you can be a really bad person to sit with. I know the at, things at some that of I'm these union conferences. Oh my gosh. Oh I, God, I, I'm so bad. You, <laughs> you have uh absolutely cracked me up a couple of times that reminds me of the times I was taken by a fit of the giggles in church, you know, that that same thing of, uh, I just can't laugh here. I just can't. And, uh, you are a tremendous instigator uh, of that. You're, you're tre- <laughs> <laughs> instigator. You know, my grandmother, yeah. this, don't sit next to Joe. Don't sit next to Joe. He's going to get you in trouble. So I'm a little boy and my grandmother, um, she's again, raised on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And her nickname for me was uh, Schmendrick. And I never thought much about it. She's like, I, a little Schmendrick. And then she'd take a big drag off her cigarette and drink some coffee. And then, you know, I'm talking to one of my Jewish friends and I said, oh, my mother's nickname for me was Schmendrick. <laughs> and then they get really worried and they're all silent. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what the problem is. So I kind of do a little bit of research and apparently Schmendrick is a euphemism for a penis. <laughs> but really what it means literally is little devil. Oh. So so little devils can come in all kinds of <laughs> shapes and sizes, and some of them are little boys. But I think I was pegged for being a little devil really young. Uh-huh. Yes. And there is something devilish about the trickster, isn't there? I mean, that would be that would be it. I mean, Lucifer is i think related to trickster and lucifer of course is the light bringer and i find on a more serious note sometimes in an analytic session when something is in a real gridlock mm-hmm. you know the spirit of that trickster will rise up in me and i'll be able to make a little bit of a joke that will pull us both into some kind of side splitting laughter which frees us from the complex mm-hmm. just long enough to step outside and say, so what was that all mm-hmm. about now mm-hmm. that we've kind of broken the spell? Mm-hmm. So the trickster is that disruptor. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the disruptor is something that's choking us. Yes, exactly. Well, maybe it's the time to just trip blithely into the dream. <laughs> okay. Hi. This is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. This week's dreamer is a woman. Uh, She's 28, and she's a psychotherapist. And here's the dream. I'm walking along the edge of a wood along a path. 
I see a stag emerge from the wood, and then the rest of his deer herd join him. I think, wow, how magical, but it quickly becomes evident that they are a threatening presence. The stag starts running toward me, and the rest of the herd follows. I run as fast as I can, but as I start to feel the stag's breath on my back, I realize I cannot outrun him. I decide to grab him by the horns and throw him down. I kill him. And for context, uh, she says, I was partway through my psychotherapy training. At that time, I was highly distressed as I had entered in a destructive relationship and was finding it difficult to leave. And her main feelings in the dream, she says, were amazement and then fear. She also adds that the stag is a symbol that she is often used in sand trait therapy to represent her father, who took his own life when she was just 15. So I guess if we start at the top, she's walking along the edge of a wood. So right away, we know where we are. We are sort of at the edge of something unconscious. And the stag emerges from the wood along with the rest of the deer herd. You know, I'm thinking in the context of of how she's right on the edge or that liminal space, the boundary between the unconscious, which is often what a wood or forest represents, and uh, something else that is in a different psychological realm. So she's traversing along a boundary right at the outset. And, and the initial reaction from the ego to the stag is, wow, how magical. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that is a, a real sort of fairy tale moment. There's a lot of fairy tales where the, the king is hunting the, the hind through the wood and, you know, follows the animal into the deep into the forest. And then something important happens there, you know. So there's, there's, there it is that there is something numinous about it. And that's the ego's first reaction. But that winds up to be a little bit naive. Mm-hmm. Right. And like all archetypal forces, there can be this incredible, glorious, positive potential, but there can be unpredictable, destructive potential at the same time. And so we get to see both this kind of Lord of the Forest, kind of that moment in Bambi, where you see the Lord of the Forest, the stag, And then you get to see the stag when it is contending for ownership of the herd. Because stags attack, they attack enemies, but they attack like that to someone who is going to challenge them. And so one of the things that I often feel in dreams, I'm tracking the movement of libido. And I feel like as the life force moves through each of the symbols, it takes on the patina of the image that it's being held by. So for me, the stag appears, which is a kind of unmediated, instinctive, archetypal masculinity. Mm -hmm. Now, often when we lose a parent early in life, as she did at 15, there's a tremendous amount of, for her, father potential, which is not mediated or is not shaped by memories of the father, And yet the masculine energy still shows up in the psyche, often in these instinctive animal kingdom or other kinds of primal images. So the primal father begins running towards her, and then the primal father rises up in her. So there's a way in which the stag evokes the stag. They lock horns as they do in the wild. And the question is, who's going to emerge as the one who is in charge. Yeah. And we have mm-hmm. a conclusion. You, you know, um, that's such a good point. And Von Franz has written something that is uh, really echoes that. And she says, the hunter and the hunter are secretly identical. And then she adds, the seeker and the spiritual goal, as well as the pathway to it, are one and the same. But, you know, we usually, especially a dream like this, we see from a subjective point of view that these are images in the dreamer's psyche. Uh, they're not external world uh, realities. A- and uh, so this moment 
where she realizes she can't outrun the stag and it's not a wondrous benign figure is a moment of of a confrontation a turning around and and the hunted becomes the hunter she is the one who defeats or in effect hunts this stag who has been hunting her uh, so there's an interesting conjunctio here of these two forces uh, full on meeting one another that results in the death of uh, the stag part of her psyche. There's something so poignant to me about this dream, given that she has this association between the stag and her father, and the way that that kind of loss in that particular way would really arrest something and uh, kind of split off a quantum of energy into the unconscious, say, perhaps in the form of this stag that wouldn't be available to the ego for life. And so, you know, it emerges from the forest and it's all magical and numinous and blah, 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 but really it's threatening to take her down. And I imagine that 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 must have been a very real experience for this dreamer, that this kind of ungrounded, unmediated father energy roaming around the psyche in the form of this stag was perhaps quite threatening in a way to her, let's say, ego stance or stability. And so turning toward it and wrestling it to the ground um, is sort of tragic and at the same time, perhaps absolutely necessary, that something has to be integrated and it can't just be left to roam through the unconscious. And something is achieved through the wrestling, that there's a certain power has to wake up in her. I think that in that moment where the stag is breathing on her back, and breath is a very powerful um, archetypal symbol, the ruach, that moved across the waters at the beginning of the world. So we can imagine the ruach or the life force of the stag is is entering into mm-hmm. her. Yeah, that's and interesting. Again, activating something yes. that she could not have imagined that she was capable of, mm-hmm. which was allows her to contend and perhaps to contend in the world, which is something of a forest. We talk about trickster and primal energies. She can't be walking through the forest like a naive girl. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. She's not. She's an adult. But in this world, she's kind of expecting this to be a Bambi moment. And the forest educates her. You are, when you're in the forest, you're a denizen of the forest and you can't be naive. Mm-hmm. You've mm-hmm. got to have muscle. Although, you know, what I'm thinking about here is she's walking along the edge of a wood. So she's right there on the boundary. I'm also tying this into what she says that uh, she had, she'd been in a, d- a destructive relationship and was finding it difficult to leave. And then we have, I'm sure, a very complicated uh, and powerful history with, with her father, uh, who she imaged as a stag. Uh, so, so there is this engagement and the discovery of her own aggression. Uh, and in this case, I mean, the, the murderous aggression and something something has to die here and it has to be the stag that is menacing. And I'm thinking about, you know, stags are not, you know, peaceful, sweet little animals when it's time for them to mate and their antlers have grown. Uh, you can hear them bellowing in the forest for miles. It is a ferocious combat, often to the death. And so there's something here about uh, her combating maybe her history with her father and com- uh, the destructive part of that, her imagery of a stag in Santre and this relationship and, and being able to you know, lock horns with it, as it were. And if I imagine literally somebody having the strength to throw down oh. a stag, 
she's like been transformed into a maynad or something. Yeah. I mean, this, <laughs> mm-hmm. this something archetypal mm-hmm. has entered into the ego and made her kind of a giantess uh, mm-hmm. in this world, which um, if there's telos in it, may be required for her. Maybe it's required to be able to walk away from that relationship that is not good for her. Not necessarily that she has to throw down her partner, but she might need these big muscular arms to pack up her bags and get the heck out of there yeah. and not look back. Yep. I, I think, think we've circled around it. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.